nationally renowned political pollster who has worked with clients in 31 states, helping elect candidates to federal, legislative, judicial, and local <coughs> offices. John Cumion is a native of Baton Rouge, a graduate of LSU, and is actually a CPA. But he took his lifelong love of politics and combined his interest in analysis of voter and election data and opened up JMC Enterprises in 2010. Nine short years, he has gone from Baton Rouge to helping candidates get elected all over the country. So, without further ado, let's give a, a press club welcome to John Cooper. So, I heard a rumor that there's an election going on. <laughs> it's good to be back today. The reason I'm here today is I want to talk to everybody about the 2019 elections. More specifically, I'm going to focus on the legislative elections and the statewide, i.e. the governor's race. And then, of course, I'll be happy to entertain any questions after my presentation is over. The first thing I think that's important to talk about, the legislative elections. They occur at the same time as governor's election does, and of course, the other statewide races. In discussing the legislative elections, to me, there are three dates that are very relevant to what is going to happen because you have to look at what has happened in the past. The first of those three dates was 1995. That was when voters by a 76 to 24 percent margin via a constitutional amendment approved term limits. The trick, or rather the catcher with the voter approval of that amendment, however, is that the 12-year term limit clock did not start ticking until 1996. But still, 1995 is important from the standpoint of that being the genesis of term limits it was also important because before 1995, Republicans really were not uh, a notice, but they were not really substantial in terms of their membership in the legislature. That very much changed in the 95 elections when the Republicans picked up six seats in the Senate and eight seats in the House, and for the first time, they became a force to be reckoned with. The second date that I think is important to discuss when we're talking about kind of the context under which legislative elections are being held is 2007, for the reason being that in 2007, that is technically when term limits had their impact because the term limits clock started ticking in 1995, or really technically 1996. However, for those who think that term limits created a wholesale change in the legislature, there's one very cautionary note that I would like to mention today, and that is while there was this change of membership in the House, the same cannot be said of the state senate that year, for the simple reason being that the term limits legislation, while it did prescribe or rather limit a legislator to 12 years in office, it said nothing against the legislator deciding to change from the House to the Senate and vice versa. And in fact, that is what happened in the Louisiana Senate. I was looking at some statistics last night, and in, this, in the class that was elected in 2007, you had 17 senators who were reelected. You had 18 who came over from the House, leaving four newcomers. And one of those four was related to an existing state senator, David, uh, Francis Heitmeyer. So technically, you only had three true newcomers in the state Senate. So even though in 2007, you had term limits have their impact, my argument is that it was a it was muted impact, particularly in the state Senate. Now that we're here in 2019, those people who were elected in 2007 after 12 or more years of seniority will be term limited. A few will most likely try to seek election to the other chamber. That's, that's a natural occurrence. But I do think you're going to have a greater potential for changes in the legislature than you did in 2007. So that's the context under which I think the legislative elections have to be appreciated, is the fact that the 1995 was an important date, as was 2007, as will be 2019. What I think is also important to appreciate in talking about the 2019 legislative elections is the fact that I do foresee partisan changes. Just like I had mentioned, there were substantial partisan changes in 1995 there were also partisan changes in 2007 when all of a sudden many districts that were electing Democrats purely out of habit and or because that person was an incumbent 
those districts became open, and lo and behold, they elected Republicans. And both in the House and the Senate, Republicans reached near parity in 2007. What that means in terms of the 2019 elections is this. I've been looking at all the special elections that have occurred since Governor Edwards was inaugurated, and in fact, the Democratic Party has lost power since then. More specifically, what I have seen is that there, were, there are three less Democrats in the House than there were in 2006. While technically Republicans picked up those three seats in places such as Minden and in Sulphur, that historically would never have elected Republicans to the legislature before, or oh, in Crowley, in Minden and Sulphur and Crowley, what also happened is that independents picked up two seats, one in Gretna and one up in the Felicianas earlier this year. So for all practical purposes, even though the Democrats have lost steam, which is three seats, Republicans really only picked up a net of one. Independents picked up two seats. So the Independent Caucus technically doubled. What I see happening, given that I've seen this continual erosion of Democrats in more rural areas, there is a concentration, concentration of seats in central Louisiana, more specifically between about Highway 190 and Alexandria, that historically they would vote Democratic out of habit in places like Evangeline Parish, and Boyles Parish, Vernon Parish, etc. Democrats barely survived in 2007 when those seats were open for the first time in years. Well, now that those incumbents who are who have been there for 12 years are term limited this year, I do see a real chance for Republicans to pick up seats in these rural areas. And in fact, what I have seen over the long term, Republicans have started competing in and or winning elections in rural areas with one very major caveat. And that caveat is once the black voter population gets above 30%, I find that Republicans are not really viable in terms of winning those seats. And we certainly saw that happen in recent special elections at Point Capee Parish and in the Felicianas, where they have a black voter population of above 35%. Republicans made an effort to take those seats, but fell short. But given what I'm seeing in terms of the long-term decline of Democrats in the rural areas, I do see, when looking at the legislative elections this year, I can see Republican gains in the Senate of one to two and gains in the House of four to seven. And I'm talking about realistic seats they realistically can take given the political complexion of those districts. So that's certainly something that the new governor, no matter who it is, will have to contend with as a more conservative legislature. And I think that the Republicans can come close to reaching the two-thirds mark in the House. And of course, there are a couple seats short of that in the Senate, which they may or may not attain depending on how one or two districts go this fall. So that's the legislative elections as I see as I see it from a partisan perspective. What I'd also like to talk about today, which is really the bulk of my speech, are the statewide elections, more specifically the governor's race. What I want to do, given that undoubtedly you've heard partisan talking points from either side about Governor Edwards' political position, I'm going to argue both sides of the issue, as in I'm going to give reasons he could be reelected versus reasons I don't think he could be reelected. And the sound bite that I think should preface this is this. I think Governor Edwards is in good shape, but not in great shape politically. The reasons I think he could be reelected, let's start off with those, I believe, and always starting with the positive. He has had a he has had a good approval rating, more specifically by looking at morning consult polls which are published nationally for all 50 states. They track the approval ratings of all the governors across the nation on a quarterly basis. And what Governor Edwards' approval ratings have been since the first quarter of 2018, he's hovered around the 50% mark in terms of approval, which again is good but not great, because of course approval rating and what you'll get in an actual election do not necessarily agree all the time. But I do think he starts off with a good approval rating, so that's something that has to be counted as a positive. I also think, too, whenever you're talking about elections, a lot of times I deal with data, which is really more the theoretical, but elections have candidates, and what the personality of those candidates is or are is very important because you're talking about candidate quality. I think Governor Edwards benefits from having a good work ethic, meaning that he's done an excellent job of 
basically giving the impression that he's paying attention to everything going on around the state, that he's interested in Louisiana, that he doesn't have ambitions higher than that of governor of Louisiana. Also, that work ethic matters very much if you're talking about a candidate trying to get that candidate to raise the sufficient funds to be reelected, because of course, the elections in Louisiana are certainly not fought over stump speeches, but fought over the, the TV and or radio airwaves. And towards that end, Governor Edwards does is a disciplined fundraiser, and I think that's something that has to be included as a positive in terms of assessing his chances for election. In other words, he's not going to be caught insufficiently funded this fall, and I would certainly expect that the $10 million that's sitting in the campaign coffers, you could easily add a couple more million dollars to that by the time qualifying comes around. The third thing which I think benefits Governor Edwards is an improved economy. More specifically, he is in the best position a governor can be in, which is when you take office at the bottom of an economic cycle, it can only go up from there, so to speak. And so when you're talking about a massive multi-billion dollar deficit that he faced at the beginning of this governorship due to the cratering of oil prices in 2014, the way I look at a cratering of oil prices is once it's hit rock bottom, it doesn't return to rock bottom for some time in the future. So basically what he has the benefit of is oil prices have relatively stabilized. If you go outside and look at what gas prices are here at Baton Rouge, they've generally been around $2.25 a gallon, give or take a few cents, depending on what part of town you're in. But the fact that the economy has improved is something that you have to count as something in his favor because that makes it much easier for him to make a rationale for re-election is when all things are going good, as opposed to if he were trying to run for an election, say in 2014, when the economy was going sharply in a different direction. So that's, a, that's something that I think is a benefit. When you're talking about the campaign, right now we know there are two serious Republicans who he's facing. That split opposition realistically mean that he, means that he has an extra month to hone his skills and put his message out while Republicans will not be having their nominees, so to speak, until October 13th. So the fact that the Republicans have divided opposition is something, again, is an intangible that I think works to Governor Edwards' favor. Finally, the, the, the last thing which I think benefits Governor Edwards is given the contentious sessions and special sessions that we have had that he could certainly make part of his re-election messaging that he is in the middle of the road staying above the fray while those legislators are fighting this program. And there's certainly precedent for this type of campaign messaging. If you go all the way back to 1995 and 1996, everybody thought that Bill Clinton after the Republican landslide in 1994 was a goner. But what Bill Clinton did to his benefit was not only did the Republicans overestimate their mandate, but he, he uh, selectively picked fights over the budget, which resulted in multiple government shutdowns, which in my opinion accrued to his benefit because all he had to do was say that I want to balance budget and I don't, have, I don't favor shutting down the government, whereas the Republicans were favoring this, that, and the other thing. That's something that I think by analogy that would also benefit Governor Edwards going into this year's campaign is he basically could take the high road and try to triangulate between the position of the House Republicans and what he wants to do. So those are the reasons that I see that he could be reelected. But you also remember that I said that he's in good but not great shape. Now let's talk about the reasons where I think he would be in trouble. The first is really that of political physics, and that is quite simply, he is facing an increasingly Republican state, and as a Democrat, that works to his disadvantage. More specifically, when we're talking about an increasingly Republican state, since he was inaugurated, or rather since he was elected, let me be more specific here, out of a denominator of approximately three million registered voters, there are 70,000 less Democrats, 95,000 more Republicans, 27,000 more independents. So in other words, the political climate in Louisiana is steadily getting less favorable for Democrats, and as a Democrat, that's something that Governor Edwards has to, has to appreciate and deal with. 
Another metric, in my opinion, which is equally as important when you're measuring the increased Republican strength in Louisiana. In 1995, I compiled all of the statistics from the legislative elections that occurred in the primary. That year, which believe it or not, was actually the first year Republicans gained appreciable strength, there were still lots of seats that were left on the table. In that election cycle, 68% of those voting for a legislative candidate picked a Democratic candidate. 30% voted Republican. If you were to fast forward to 2007, even though the Republicans reached near parity, Democrats still had a 55 to 43% edge in terms of how their legislative candidates did in the primary. Last year, excuse me, last election cycle, rather, in 2015, the legislative vote was 56 to 41 Republican. So one of the things that I've consistently seen pretty much over the last few years is there appears to be a base Republican vote in the state in the 55 to 60 percent range. So the fact that you went from 68-30 Democratic to 56-41 Republican in a generation's time, in my opinion, is yet another data point that's indicating that Democrats don't quite have the electoral punch that they once did. When you combine that with the voter registration statistics, which are equally important because that's people who are making the free choice when they either register to vote for the first time, or they change parties, or they change parishes, and the party they pick is pretty much indicative of what they're thinking at the time. So for the fact that I'm seeing this as continuous democratic erosion, in addition to what I mentioned previously about their losing three seats in the state house, those are political challenges that Governor Edwards has to face. In other words, he cannot run a partisan as a partisan Democrat because, quite simply, the numbers aren't there in Louisiana to support that kind of politics anymore. The other thing which I think is to Governor Edwards' detriment, and I'm going to sound duplicative, but it's deliberate. I mentioned before about the legislative fights being his, to his advantage. I'm also going to argue out of both sides of my mouth and saying that the disagreements he has had with the legislature over the last few sessions and special sessions also is to his disadvantage. For the simple reason being is that with Louisiana being a strong governor, having a strong governor tradition, people do have a heightened expectation as to what they think their governor could and should do. So the thought is if you're getting into repeated fights with the legislature over spending and taxes, the presumption could also be made that what are you doing wrong that you can't get along with the legislature? And by the way, former Governor Buddy Romer had a similar problem not only in 1991 when he was running for re-election, but in 1995 when he sought a comeback in the race that, of course, Mike Foster ran. One of the issues that was raised against him was the fact that he had a contentious relationship with the legislature. So that's something that, of course, Governor Edwards will have to deal with, is the fact that there have been substantial disagreements between the governor and the, mainly the House, let me be more specific, mainly the House. The third thing which I think is to Governor Edwards' detriment are the tax increases. Now, you and I know that the issue of tax increases is one that you can spin in a number of ways and get into, the, get into semantics. But here's the problem that he, Governor Edwards, faces. Even though the technical truth is there was a reversal of some of those tax increases, the net effect is that the sales tax rate and some of the credits which were taken away are still there. And so the problem is it becomes much harder as a governor to say that, well, I, there were tax cuts, but partial tax cuts. It goes back to the old political adage of if you're explaining, you're losing. So that to me is an issue which does not benefit Governor Edwards is the fact that not all of the tax increases were reversed. And quite truthfully, the Republicans can make an issue out of the fact that Lance Harris had a bill in the legislature to ratchet the sales tax down to where it was before Governor Edwards uh, became governor. And that bill is pretty much going nowhere. So like I said, I think the taxes is something that it's a very simple messaging point that can be used against the governor. And to rebut that messaging is much more complicated. And I think by the time you successfully rebutted it, voters have tuned you out. So I see that as a disadvantage for Governor Edwards. Finally, I see the issue of abortion as not being a net plus for the governor. Let me explain. Abortion is one of those types of issues that he, 
Granted, let me let me let me say at the start that Governor Edwards, in addition to the pro-life position that he clearly articulated in 2015, given that messaging, he pretty much had to sign the bill. The problem with what he did, though, is that abortion is a very complex issue, and I would argue that politically it is, and I always get this pronunciation wrong, a Rorschach test. Because depending on how you word the abortion issue, you'll get substantially different responses and polling that I have done or in the process of doing in a couple of states is showing that it very much is a function of how you word the issue. Or to paraphrase James Carville, it's the specific word of stupid. The thing that's complex about abortion is this. If you start at the most elemental level, which is pro-choice versus pro-life, Louisianians are overwhelmingly pro-life. Where the challenge begins with abortion is when you start talking about the various exceptions to where once you start bringing in the exceptions, you have a much smaller number of voters who are purely pro-life and an even smaller number of voters who are purely pro-choice. So it's a very complex issue and I would argue that a lot of what's going on with the abortion issue is theoretical. Once you start getting to the practical, which is let's say that some of those restrictions were to take effect and people were to be impacted, voters tend to rebel. And I'll give you an example going back 30 years in time, the Webster case in Missouri. What happened 30 years ago with the Webster case was that basically the Supreme Court upheld some Missouri restrictions on abortion that had been passed several years before that. And even though it came out in the late summer of 1989, what had happened was that it became the backdrop against which the gubernatorial elections in Virginia and New Jersey were conducted. Republicans lost both states because they gave the appearance of being too rigid on abortion. The true answer when you're talking about where people stand on abortion, once you get into the complexities which are there, is that the vast majority of people are somewhere in between, which is I would say that they are personally pro-life but they do favor one or more exceptions, which is getting into the issue of you know, rape, incest, save the life of the mother, at what point the pregnancy is terminated, et cetera. So it's a very complex issue to, neg to navigate. And the thing is, the reason I'm saying that it is a net negative for the governor is this. I don't really see, given that people are, not, are really in between on the abortion issue, I don't see that it would be an issue where Governor Edwards would pick up any votes per se, but the liberal democratic base he needs as his foundation for him to hope to get reelected, right now they're unhappy. Even though I don't think that they would vote for Republican, let's pretend that there were a liberal democratic candidate who all of a sudden were to jump in the race before qualifying and pull five to 10% of the vote out. That could certainly be an issue for the governor. So like I said, it's a complex issue and it's the kind of thing that there was really no good answer, but it, especially since most likely it would have been a veto-proof majority, but the fact that a bill is being signed that has no exceptions, that's not in line with what voters want, and there's historical precedent for voters reacting against that kind of legislation. The last thing I want to talk about is of course, there was a poll I did a month ago on the governor's race, because again, just like with people talking about where they think the governor's race stands right now, I have some actual numbers to back it up. I'm gonna basically talk about it at a high level, because certainly there's a lot of dis uh, interpretation and misinterpretation, and some people who, in my opinion, were quite unhappy at the results, in my opinion, unnecessarily. But what I think are the relevant takeaways from the poll that I had done a month ago is this. Number one, I'm not particularly interested in what the spread is between Ralph Abraham and Eddie Rispone at this point, because really the governor's race is at a theoretical stage. You don't really have campaigning that is occurring. Now, what's going on in Facebook in terms of, well, I went to this festival and that festival and this Republican women's meeting, that doesn't really count in terms of swaying massive groups of voters. Once the media expenditures have started, and hopefully it's within a month or two, definitely better be, with, definitely by qualifying they need to be spending money. Once that happens, then we can start to see as to which candidate between Abraham and Rispone has messaging that is more attractive to Louisiana voters. 
So like I said, I don't, I'm not personally interested in what the spread is between Abraham and Responi. There's also a statistic I'd like to share with you as to why I'm not especially interested in the spread at this point. I took the results and broke them out by congressional district. One of the things I've seen is that Ralph Abraham has, has a substantial approval from the media markets that are holding within his district, such as Alexandria Monroe. So given that, when I looked at the results in the 5th Congressional District, Ralph Abraham had a 46 to 29 lead over John Bell Edwards in his Congressional District with 2% for Responi. In the remaining five Congressional Districts, Governor Edwards had a 40 to 18 lead over Abraham with 8% for Responi. So in other words, a fair amount of the strong numbers for Ralph Abraham right now are due to the fact that he has overwhelming approval in the 5th Congressional District but since that's only one-sixth of the state, we have to see what happens with this popularity in Shreveport, like <coughs> Dan, like Charles, Baptridge, et cetera, et cetera, before we can accurately assess if indeed he is the Republican who will make it into the runoff against Governor Edwards. The second thing which I think is important, too, when we're talking about handicapping the governor's race is this. One of the things that people don't appreciate is Louisianians over the years have consistently favored the late bloomer. And an early example of what I would consider a late bloomer would be Governor Buddy Womer, who back in 1987, no one would have given him any chance of winning. But he caught a wave at the right time, which was when people were starting to pay attention. And once his numbers rocketed skyward, he became a contender, and of course, he led in the primary. I saw a similar thing happen in 1995 with Mike Foster. And I saw a similar thing happen with John Bell Edwards in 2015 because I don't think anybody would have predicted that he would have gotten 40% of the primary vote. I think the thought at the time was that he would get 25 to 30%. You actually had some people who were thinking he wasn't gonna make the runoff, although given that you do have a substantial minority of Democratic voters in the state, I never for a minute thought it would be a two Republican runoff. But point being is that Louisianans do, do tend to favor people and make up their mind late. So what that means is that there's certainly nothing to say that if Responi were to start spending money on the airwaves with effective ads, there's nothing to say that he could all of a sudden similarly rocket in the polls. And by the way, I have a more concrete recent example that now that the statute of limitations, so to speak, is up, I'm more than happy to share it with you. I was the pollster for Paul Dietzel in his 2014 congressional campaign. I conducted 10 polls during that time I worked with him. What I think is interesting was following Garrett Graves' number, because at the end of July, he was polling 3%. At the end of August, when he started spending some money, he tripled from 3 to 8%. Early October, he bumped up a little bit to 10%. Each additional poll I did throughout October, which was when people were starting to pay attention, that 10% rapidly rocketed up to 20. The, the last poll I did was the last week of October. He was at 22%, and of course, he received 27% of the primary vote. So the point of that illustration is just, just kind of a demonstration that just because someone may be polling in single digits right now, I think it would be premature to conclude that that person could not make the run. So like I said, lots could still happen between now and October. But I think what is important, though, is the fact that Regardless of how you look at the ballot test combinations in the poll I did, Governor Edwards was consistently sitting at about 40% of the vote. If you were to allocate the black undecideds to him and the Republican undecideds to Abraham plus Responi, you're looking at a 45-42 race that favors the governor right now. So in other words, a tight race, which to me is not really a surprise given the fact that you've had a steady decline of Democratic voting strength here in Louisiana. So in conclusion, I think we're going to have an interesting election season. It seems to be late developing, but of course part of that is we have to get the legislature out of town first. But I would fully expect that very shortly we're going to start seeing a ratcheting up of activity because you don't really have that much time before the before even early voting starts for that matter, much less the primary election. So having said that, the fact that I think there will be a competitive governor's race, I think there will be some interesting legislative races because of the number of House and Senate seats that will be up. I mean, I'm counting right now, at a bare minimum, if you're looking at 16 open Senate races, and if you include House term limiteds plus those couple of people who are not running for re-election, 
plus those who are switching over to the Senate, I'm counting at a minimum 40 House seats that will be taken. So you're going to have some spirited legislative elections in addition to the gubernatorial race this year. So that's my speech. I'll be more happy to take any questions. Um, you did not uh, um, address the uh, positives and negatives uh, of the Trump pact. Uh, the president, uh, while the president's numbers may have wobbled a bit down, even in the Louisiana surveys, it's not much. So he's still overwhelmingly favored by the Louisiana electorate. Uh, would he be part of a late surge against the governor? So the question, which is a really interesting one, is the Donald Trump factor, and that is given the fact that even though Donald Trump's popularity has not really improved since he got elected president, it's still strong here in Louisiana. In fact, a recent poll I did show he's, he's roughly the same as where he was in the 2016 election. And given that continued popularity in Louisiana, could he theoretically impact the governor's race? Yes, he could. I'm not convinced that he will, though, because the situation I see with the relationship that President Trump has with Governor Edwards, to me, is similar to the relationship he had with Democratic Senator Heidi Heitkamp of North Dakota last year. In other words, in the midterms last year, there were some people that President Trump clearly favored and some he clearly didn't. And those he clearly didn't, he spent more time going after them. Even though Heidi Heitkamp nevertheless still lost, which in my opinion was partially due to her Kavanaugh vote, the fact was, President Trump didn't really go after her to the extent that he could have. Given that President Trump has a fairly good relationship with Governor Edwards, and my theory about the why part is both of them share a military background, at the present time, I don't see that he would go all in against Governor Edwards. And plus, too, you, you have to have a Republican be selected first, so I could see that be a further reason for him to want to stay out in the short term. As I said, I don't, at this point in time, something prior to um, qualifying the president, you know, getting into it. But what about Jeff Landry? And then um, also, if the president and Jeff Landry uh, decided that they would have uh, express a preference for one of the other Republicans, and just left it at that. So the question, as I appreciate it, is that if Jeff Landry, in addition <clears throat> to President Trump, were to make an endorsement, would that matter? The way, the way I look at that is this, being that you are a down ballot official, which in the case of what Jeff Landry is, I don't think he would pack a widespread electoral punch if he were to endorse a candidate. I can see, however, him having an effect in terms of swaying Republican activists. So if let's pretend you had a situation where near early voting that there were only a few points that were separating Abraham and Rasponi, I can see a Jeff Landry endorsement possibly swinging votes in terms of who the Republican activists would support. Yes. I know you down me. Yes. Okay. I know you downplayed the spread between Rasponi and Abraham in your poll. Yes. Uh, but do, do you believe that that spread can be overcome strictly by positive campaign advertising? Or do you think it's inevitable that there would have to be negative attack ads run? And if the negative attack ads run, do you think they may backfire based upon a sour taste that an awful lot of Republicans have from the 2015 election uh, that many believe that that is why we are where we are in having the governor? So I'd like to just see if you think that spread, I know you're downplaying it, yeah. but can it be totally overcome by nothing but positive? Campaigning. So the question here is about the current spread between Abraham and Rasponi, which I have at the present time downplayed, and if that spread would necessarily hold up and how it pertains to any positive or negative campaigning that's going to go on between the two Republicans. There are two things I look at with regards to your question. The first is you have a substantial money imbalance, which is with Rasponi having a 10 to 1 difference in terms of cash on hand, that's a lot more uh, saturation of the airwaves that can occur in terms of getting your message out. Now, in terms of if it's a positive or negative, I do think to some extent, and I have seen this happen in campaigns since that 2015 election, to some extent Republicans have kind of been chastised, or ch really chastened, I think is the appropriate term to use here, because the 
campaigning that went on between the Republicans and the 2015 gubernatorial race, in my opinion, got to the thermonuclear level where you aren't just talking about highlighting differences between the candidates, you're talking about getting downright ugly to the point to where one or more of them is going to endorse you in the runoff. I do think it had collateral damage in terms of how the runoff went, number one. Number two, what I have seen happen since then, and I think the 2016 Senate election, and to a lesser extent, the Treasurer and Secretary of State's race, are good examples of learning from your mistakes. I don't think the Republicans are allowing themselves to get put into that position again. Plus, I think that given that the Republicans very much want the governor's mansion back because of their dominance at just about every other level at the top of ballot in Louisiana, I could see a case where if the campaign were to go to that level of negativity, that I think there would be some negative pushback coming from uh, party types, from donors, and so forth. So in other words, I don't think there would be the same tolerance for that type of campaigning. I mean, obviously at some point there's going to be some negativity. The question is, will the negativity get to the extent that would preclude one from endorsing the other? I mean, a perfect example of that uh, rebuttal would be the Secretary of State's race last year, where it did get fairly ugly at points, but all the candidates did fall into line behind Kyle Waterman, who of course won substantially. So I think that there have been some lessons that have been learned since 2015 that would keep it from getting to the level that it did back then. The poll uh, percentages for Trump, and considering if you have a uh, aggressive Republican legislature, why would Edwards be immune from tweets from Trump? Nothing else you can be. So there's two parts of this question. One is the Trump percentage, and one is the extent to which Governor Edwards would be immune from any tweets coming from Donald Trump. So first off, uh, President Trump carried Louisiana by 58, uh, 58 to 38, or 20 point margin. And in the poll that I did recently, it shows President Trump's approval to disapproval rating is 54 to 37%. So even though it is somewhat less than the 58% he received in the presidential election, my attitude is I've seen a similar, a similar diminution of support across the nation, as in whatever he received in the 2016 election, I've seen his approval rates are a couple of points against that. So it's not particularly surprising to me that Louisiana will be a, similarly a couple of points less. So 54 to 37 to me is not really anything to ring the alarm bells over. Now in terms of immunity from a, a tweet from President Trump, President Trump certainly has the ability to stir up the electorate, particularly the Republican electorate if he wanted to, especially since I've seen consistent tr uh, strength from President Trump once you get beyond the back region of the world's media markets. In other words, in areas, more rural areas of Southwest and Central and North Louisiana, President Trump has maintained his rock solid support, and he has a degree of allegiance to him that I have not seen since Ronald Reagan. I guess what I'm questioning, however, is if he has enough animus against John Bell Edwards to where he would fire those salvos. And that's that's the assumption I'm questioning. But I certainly agree he could have some impact if he wanted to. Yes. If the governor is going to remain in office, does he have to win the primary? The, the question here is, will, does the governor have to win the primary if he remains in office? That's the expectation. I don't think it can happen, and I'll tell you why. Because in addition to the fact that you have Abraham and Rispone, there's another factor that hasn't been addressed yet, which happens in every gubernatorial election. That is, you will have, in my opinion, five to ten minor candidates who are also going to run in addition to the three who are announced. And you have to, you cannot discount the possibility that you would have a more progressive Democrat also running. So I see those extra factors, which is the extra candidates plus possibly a progressive candidate, easily pulling 5 or 10% of the vote off. And by the way, he doesn't necessarily have to win the primary. Let's pretend he gets 45% and more progressive and also ran candidates got 5 to 7%. Well, that to me is something that can be made up in the runoff with an aggressive turnout operation and, and or if one of your opponents stumbles. 
There's actually a precedent for that, by the way. When Mary Landry was running for re-election in 20, 2002, this was her first, the end of her first term, even though technically she received 46% of the vote in the primary, there were a couple other Democratic candidates in the race who received an addition of 2%. So technically, the Democratic vote, as I see it, or saw it, rather, was 48%. So going from 48 to 50% when you're talking about a primary held, let's see, I think that was a November primary, versus a runoff held over the Christmas holidays where you're going to have a huge decline in support because it's very tough doing any electioneering over the holiday season. Going from 48 to 50% is not really hard if you have an aggressive ground game, which is what she did. So what matters a lot to me, I, I personally don't see the, the 50% as being a barrier to entry in terms of his being reelected. What matters more to me is what the Democratic vote will be in October. In other words, what Edwards plus the other Democratic candidate or candidates get, or even the third party candidate or candidates if the third party vote is more moderate and is turned off by the rhetoric of the Republicans. So it's not an absolute requirement that he get 50%. What I think is important is he tried to get in that 45 to 47% range because that plus the minor candidates does put you in that theoretical range of being able to get 50% of them off. Follow up? Well, if, if I just might push a little further on that. Uh, suppose, <laughs> suppose there isn't. Uh, a, uh, a, another Democratic candidate in the race, or suppose that that Democratic candidate, if they do get, is really only taken away from JB anyway. Um, let me just ask the question again: If this if it's the same field that we have now, or at least similar numbers, does he have? So, no, you're, you're assuming a three-candidate primary. Will I, 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 I'm assuming what we have now, basically, running yeah. on that. You assume there might be something else, which I think was a fair point. Yes. But what if, what if, it, what if there is no you know, uh, other candidates eating up 7%? The question is, if we were to restrict it to three candidates, what would the answer be? And, and I'll partially answer it, but I'm partially going to push back as well. So partially answer, the way I look at it is, then in that case, if you truly had three and no, no more than three candidates, what you as Governor Edwards would want to, what Governor Edwards rather would want to do would be to get as close to 50% as possible and hope that he could make up for that with an aggressive ground game and or maybe some animus between uh, Responding and Abraham. There was a precedent for that incidentally back when Mary Landrieu was running for re-election. In addition to the fact that the Democratic vote was 48%, there was also some animus between Cooksey and Terrell and Cooksey basically, so to speak, took his marbles and went home. And in fact, if you were to look at the December 2002 runoff results, I saw double-digit decreases in turnout in the northeast Louisiana parishes that Terrell very much needed. So that's easily worth one to two percent is if you have that disappointment factor. So that's the part where I will agree with you. The part where I will disagree is I've consistently seen in just about any statewide election of any significance. You have a lot of also rants who are going to jump in just because they want to or whatever other reasons. I've very rarely seen a governor's race that has less than 10 candidates. Now, 10, 10 serious candidates, that's a different issue, but I still think there's going to be 10 to 15 candidates easily filing a vote. I have one question for yes. you. Yes. Last time, uh, this, uh, there are a lot of senior Yemenis for two decades, two centuries here in Louisiana, and Abraham is one of them. Yes. And uh, the governor went to Israel. So, have you done any polling? Do you have any, anything to share with us? So, the question is the impact of the Syrian slash Lebanese vote. The way I look at that, certainly we have the benefit of good restaurants here in Baton Rouge for that very reason. However, what the assumption would have to be to assume that the trip to Israel would make any difference would be number one, Abraham and Rispone would have to make it an issue. Number two, you have to assume that those in Louisiana who are of Syrian or Lebanese ancestry would have a strong ethnic identification. In other words, if they've been here multiple generations and they're quote unquote Americanized, I would argue that that issue would not have as much salience. Thank you. All right, everybody, thank you very much.